56, and let me just give you the background. Um, <clears throat> some, uh, what you would say, alumni from previous weeks of prayer, uh, if that's the right term for it, have uh, given us feedback, and we do welcome feedback, how we can tweak this week to make it more profitable. And one of the uh, think comments that has come back to us uh, from more than one person is, is it possible that we could incorporate some fasting into the week of prayer? So at least some of it would be uh, prayer and fasting. So we thought about it as a committee, prayed about it, and we felt that, that would be a good thing. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I want to just share some thoughts on that subject. So in Matthew 6, I want you to notice the Lord Jesus is teaching on various things that um, are normative uh, in the verse um, Five, he says, when thou prayest. And again, the assumption is that this is what a disciple will do. A disciple will, will be a giving person. A disciple will be a praying person. And, and so it says, when thou prayest. And then again, he says uh, <coughs> later on in verse 7, or in verse 7, but when you pray. Uh, so again, he's giving instructions on prayer. The assumption is that that's what a disciple will do. But uh, if you look at verse uh, 16, he says, moreover, when ye fast. So uh, it's kind of interesting. For most of us, as disciples of the Lord Jesus, we recognize our responsibility to give. We recognize our responsibility to pray. But fasting <coughs> seems to be something that we're less familiar with, less of a common experience amongst the people of God. But the Lord Jesus says, when you fast, the assumption is you will it's part of what a disciple does. There are times when a disciple abstains from things that are perfectly legitimate for spiritual reasons, spiritual purposes behind their abstaining from legitimate things. So, so I just wanted to say that at the start, the assumption is that that's part of normal discipleship. The fact that it is such a foreign idea to most of us maybe is an indication that we're a bit clueless when it comes to true discipleship. It's just a, a thought. <laughs> because it is a foreign idea, but it's not an unbiblical idea. It's right there. The Lord Jesus says that when you fast, the assumption is you will. So I'm not going to ask the question, has anybody ever done it? Or I don't want to embarrass anybody. But the assumption is that that should be normal. So let's look at chapter 9 now, Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> because uh, sometimes, well, we... We can, we can use our dispensational theology as a nice excuse to get out of things. <coughs> and um, much as I'm pretty much convinced of dispensationalism, uh, I, uh, again, you've got to be a slave to the text of Scripture first and foremost, not to any system of man. And so we want to just stick with what does the Word of God say, and so when you look at Matthew 9, verse 14, uh, we read something interesting. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So my question would be, is the bridegroom here, with us, physically present, or is he absent? He's at, he's at the Father's right hand, isn't he? He's going to come and get us soon. But the assumption is that, okay, they're not going to fast because the bridegroom's there, but when he's gone then they will fast. So I would think, seeing as the bridegroom is currently absent, this would be a perfect time for his disciples to fast. Okay? So again, we just say it. it's, it's right there. Now, look at Matthew 17. Matthew 17. And some of you, if you have uh, different translations, this verse may not be there. But I want to assure you that in 99.9% .9 of all manuscripts, it's here. Okay, so if you've bought into the lie that the older manuscripts 
are better, then you need to repent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, to, in, at least in my thinking, if 99.9% .9 of all manuscripts have this verse, we ought to pay attention to it. Okay, only three, only three don't. Okay, only three manuscripts do not have it. 99.9% .9 of the rest do. So let's just kind of get the flow. Verse 20, Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for well, verily I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And the context is, there was a man who was demon possessed, and the disciples, although they had some success in casting out demons previously, when it came to this particular individual, they could not cast out the demon. And Jesus is teaching them concerning this, first of all, that it could be directly related to their unbelief. But then he says, a further explanation, that this particular type is not removed by prayer alone, but by prayer and fasting. And so it would, it would tell us that there are certain spiritual situations that are so entrenched, so strong, so powerful, that it requires extra measures, extra weaponry, if you like, uh, extra armory being, being brought to the battlefield in order to remove this obstacle, this mountain, this difficulty. And in this context, uh, it's this man who was demon-possessed. He said that uh, this kind does not go out by prayer and fasting. And I think if we think about our culture today, there, there are things that are very entrenching in our culture. How many people are entrenched uh, in the stronghold grip of pornography, for instance? Mm -hmm who are trying to get free but can't seem to get free. Maybe we need to be praying and fasting for breakthrough mm -hmm. in some of those <coughs> enslaving sins that are just not, people are not getting victory in. Maybe uh, other areas, uh, maybe uh, we're in a place where it seems to be a real hardness towards the gospel. And, uh, and uh, what, what can we do? Well, we can pray, but we could bring out some additional kind of armory to the battle, and we can pray and do without that which is legitimate to concentrate our energies on crying out to God for the stronghold to come down. Just look, uh, please, at Acts 13. Acts 13. We're just, we're just running through a few verses, and then I'll be done. I just want you to see. I just want you to see that I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is this is a tool that we're not really making the the best use of, and we should consider Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, "Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them." And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So here we have, uh, again, the context of a church, the church at Antioch, and um, there uh, some of the Christians are praying and fasting, and uh, I, I would suggest to you, I uh, won't be dogmatic about it, but I wonder, was it, what, was it the fact of how do we fulfill the Great Commission was perhaps part of their praying? Because the answer, as they pray and fast, is separate me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I've called them. Could it be that they were they were crying out to God, you've given us these, this this commanding, uh, our commanding officer has given us these orders, and, and where do we go from here? Uh, we've made it from Jerusalem to Antioch, what next? Lord, show us the next step. And so they're praying for guidance, for direction, how do we reach our generation? With the, with the message of the gospel and the answer is given, well, Barnabas and Saul, separate them for the work that I've called them. But they're praying and fasting. They prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. 
if ever there's a need for prayer and fasting, maybe it's a need for the raising up and recognition of godly leadership Amen. in our churches. Okay? If there's a desperate need for godly leadership, isn't there? Men raised up by the Holy Spirit, and prayer and fasting seems to be connected with that. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, again, just to see that this is not just the Gospels, it's in the Epistles too, which means that it's hard to wiggle out of it dispensationally. Uh, it's right here, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. Um, speaking of the husband-wife relationship, it says, Defraud you not one the other, um, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Mm. And so the idea is that his uh, normal married life and they're part of the, uh, the intimate relationships between a man and a woman, uh, and he said, but there might be a time where even though that's perfectly normal and legitimate, you set that aside and even set eating aside because you have a burden as a couple about something that you need to pray about mm -hmm. and, and seek the Lord. So you, you just put everything that's legitimate on hold <coughs> to seek the face of God. And it could be wayward children. Uh, it, it could be uh, some financial crisis in your marriage. It could be... Uh, your marriage relationship itself is struggling and that you just need to get together, put everything else that's perfectly normal on the shelf and just seek God together in prayer and fasting. Amen. And so again, we just see lots of evidence here of this, um, this fasting being, being normative in the life of a disciple. I guess that's what I want to say. It's not something weird or strict. The fact that we don't practice it, for the most part, the problem is not with the scripture. The problem with, is with us. We're not paying attention. <laughs> because it's pretty clear to me that this is something that should be not. So, uh, in order to uh, facilitate that, Wednesday, there will be no lunch provided. Now, a few for medical, I realize there's some people... Uh, maybe diabetic or whatever, you, that's just not a possibility for you. Well, the restaurants will be open. They're, they've told me they're not closing all the local restaurants just so for our day of prayer and fasting. But, um, but the downstairs will be closed. However, uh, for those of us that can't make it through the day without caffeine, there still will be <laughs> coffee and there will be uh, other drinks available. So it's, not, it's, it's just a food fast not a liquid fast. Now, Wednesday evening, I don't know why that's doing what it's doing, but anyway, Wednesday evening, there will be um, the usual, uh, this assembly always has a meal together on Wednesday evening, and they're going to continue on with that. Uh, whether you participate in that is between you and the Lord. And again, if you, if you don't convicted about that we're not it's not we're not twisting anybody's arm it's up before you, you and the lord if you feel you'd like to join those of us that plan to fast that day uh, we would love to have you joining with us uh, to concentrate all our efforts on seeking the face of god but if if it's not your conviction that's between you and the lord so but if you are going to bring a big bacon sandwich i would appreciate it if you do not eat it in my presence <laughs> because I try not to make it hard for those of us that decide we are going to fast okay so be discreet uh, if you feel like you need to eat okay so that's that's just the thoughts uh, on that let's just pray father we we're thankful for the the clarity uh, of the word of god and uh, again lord we do pray that we would be uh, authentic disciples in every respect and uh, not pick and choose the things that we want to practice, but uh, uh, that just like the Lord Jesus says, when you fast, and uh, we we just want to be those that uh, take seeking you very, very seriously. And so we pray for that. And uh, again, Lord, we pray particularly for spiritual breakthroughs, even this week. Lord, we recognize that there are many gripped by various strongholds, and Lord, we want to see your people enjoying what the Lord Jesus promised. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And the truth shall make you free. And we just want people to experience 
true freedom in Christ from every and, and any kind of bondage Amen. and that we might be a people that with great liberty serve thee the best of masters and we just ask these things for the honor and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave us that example 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting Lord we want to be more like the master help us in these things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen, Amen.